Welcome, everyone. I'm delighted to lead this panel in this discussion on dating and marriage. And um, I would just like to situate myself and say that I understand myself as a woman based on the way that my parents raised me, as well as female role models in my life. And that for me, I grew up in a Christian family and home, attending church pretty regularly. And collectively, this social environment taught me what it meant to live as a woman. And one of the expectations being that someday I would marry um, someone and start a family. And I've dated a handful of men. I was almost engaged once. And I've been a bridesmaid in many, many weddings. Um, but I have yet to find Mr. Wright. Um, but a, an important factor for me is his faith. And so today, I'm excited that our panel is going to have us talking about the gendered aspects um, of dating and marriage. Um, to look at, as women of faith, how do we approach and examine how faith informs or complicates uh, our intimate relations, relationships, uh, commitment, and forming families. And to start, let me introduce our panelists. Um, so sitting closest to me is Susan Katzmiller, and uh, she is a, has a journalist background and is also an author. Uh, she graduated from Brown University and has worked for Newsweek um, across the US in, in New York and also in Los Angeles. And she has worked and lived in Senegal and also in Brazil, brings that life background to her. But today, most interestingly, she is a child of an interfaith marriage and she is now within an interfaith marriage herself. And that helps to form um, her blog called onbeingbotho.com as well as a, a recent book that she has come out with called On Being, or Being Both. So she'll speak from that perspective today. And next to her is Salma Ab Abu Jaderi. Uh, she's a licensed professional counselor uh, in Northern Virginia. And she's also the founding board member of Peaceful Families Project. And um, as a therapist, she works with couples and can speak from that perspective today. Um, and she. She has also done, uh, for, with the Peaceful Families Project, she serves as a primary trainer in the area of domestic violence prevention. But she has also written and contributed to several books as well. Again, uh, Walking Together, Working with Women from Diverse Religious Traditions, and Counseling Muslims, a handbook on mental health issues and interventions. So I think we'll hear various perspectives from her. And finally, it's um, the far end of the panel. We have Molly Ziegler-Hemingway. And she is a, has a journalist background and is now the senior editor at The Federalist. Um, and she has worked and written for The Wall Street Journal, USA Today, The, the Los Angeles Times, and various other uh, journalist, uh, journalistic out, outputs, um, outlets. So let's go ahead and get us started. I thought that it would be nice if we could start the conversation by having uh, each of our panelists talk a little bit about um, themselves. Um, so I'd like to ask each of you if you are married, and if you are, can you please um, share with us how religion has influenced your own dating or your own um, married, married life, your marriage experience? So Susan, would you like to start? Sure. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to go back a generation because my parents are an interfaith couple, and they married more than 50 years ago now, and they're still happily married. My dad's 90. My mom's 84. And that has really informed my spiritual journey and the way I see interfaith families, which is the topic that I usually write about. I married my husband more than 25 years ago now. And people sometimes ask me, well, did you have an interfaith marriage? And my response is, well, I kind of had to because I represent two religions because I come from two religions. And so no matter who I married, it was going to be an interfaith marriage the way I see it. Um, unless I suppose I found somebody else who was also both. Uh, my husband and I have two children. They're now 17 and 20. So I'm an interfaith parent who's sort of coming to the close of that period of intensive parenting. And so I have this three generation interfaith family that I'm drawing on and that I wrote about in the memoir chapter of my book. Most of my book, though, is journalism. I interviewed, surveyed, researched over 100 other interfaith families, 250 other interfaith parents, and wrote about their experiences raising interfaith children. Okay. 
Um, good afternoon. Uh, yes, I'm married, and um, I also want to step back a generation just because it provides context. So I'm, uh, my parents were first-generation immigrants uh, from Egypt via Europe, and I think that's really important because that's how our attitudes become shaped through culture. Um, and definitely I would say that religion had a lot to do with uh, when I got married and how I got married. Um, and it was, you know, mostly the, the way that my uh, father read the religious teachings. And so he was, we were four girls in the family and he encouraged us to get married young. And he succeeded. Uh, three out of the four of us got married um, around the age of 18. And uh, my youngest sister got married at 30. So, and he was always after me, get your, you gotta convince your sister to get married. And I'm like, she's, she's fine, just let her enjoy her life. You know, <laughs> marriage will come. Um, and so the fact that I got married at such a young age um, means that I myself didn't really have the opportunity to think too much or know too much yet about what I believed about marriage practices. Um, um, and so as my father was um, suggesting that okay, you finished high school, it's time for you to get married. And I said, I remember this conversation like it happened yesterday. I said, I'm not interested in getting married now. I want to go to college. And he said, well, you can get married and you can go to college. And, um, um, but it's time. There's no reason for you not to get married. Okay. Um, and so um, I had already known my husband. We, we had kind of known each other as family friends. Um, so it was definitely a marriage of choice. Um, I still believe to this day that I wasn't ready to get married. I think I was way too young. But we, we've managed, we made it work, and we're uh, celebrating our 31st anniversary um, at the end of this year. Thank you. And I am also married, and uh, I was way too old to get married, basically. But, um, <laughs> and my story actually also goes back to my parents, and that's because uh, religion is very important in our lives, and my parents were both converts to Lutheranism, that crazy, crazy sect you've heard so much about. And uh, they valued this very highly. This was very important to them. My dad is a pastor, my mother converted as an adult. And so it was definitely expected that we would marry someone who was in the faith, or if we found something better, that we would alert the entire family and we would all convert in mass, I guess, was the plan. Um, so it, it worked for my brother and my sister and I. We all married Lutherans. Uh, what's interesting is in the same way that my parents were both converts, my brother and my sister and I also married converts, and the people that we married were not Lutheran when we met them. Um, and I never really dated that many people inside my own religion, but um, I dated quite a few people who either became Lutheran or uh, you know, maybe it would have not been such a big jump. And only once did I come you know, close to uh, having a marriage, you know, I came close to marrying someone who was outside of my faith. And uh, so I've kind of you know, run the whole gamut, but it was definitely an important part in my family that we all marry in the same faith. Okay. Great, thank you. I think those are great stories to get us going. Um, I'd like to follow up by, by asking and thinking about the context that we're living in. Um, in the US, it's a diverse country. There is certainly a lot of religious freedom and different, different traditions that, are, um, that exist. And, there, and for some people, it's a secular society, and faith is not important to them. But today's event is with women of faith. So I would like to ask you, um, given the diversity that we have within the US, how much weight does religious identity or religious ritual um, have on dating or on engagement? Um, what have you seen in your own story? We've started to talk about it, Molly, um, but also what have you seen from others, um, other female friends or other f women uh, in your family or social circles? Who wants to take it? Um, well, I guess viewing that question through my interfaith family's lens, I would say that the dominant discourse has been that if you intermarry, if you have an interfaith family, that you will become faithless, that it will become impossible to be a person of faith um, or to have religion be a strong presence in the family. And in my research in the families that I interviewed, that I surveyed, it's simply not true. And I, I think it's interesting because I think gender is related here because I see three gender-related strands that sort of weave through 
um, the narrative of interfaith families. One is that I see women pushing back against the idea that you have to convert in order to intermarry and that everybody in the family has to have the same religion in order to have religion survive in the family. And instead what I see is women who are bringing their faith to the family and that it doesn't necessarily require that they convert or that their, their husband converts. Um, the second strand I would pull out is that I also see women kind of pushing back against the idea that they are solely responsible for teaching children religion in the family and that there really can be a partnership where the couple together decides what religious practices they want the child to have in the interfaith family and that they work together to give the child one religion or the other or both or none if that's their choice but that it shouldn't just be the woman's role to take the kids to Sunday school and give them religion. Um, and the third strand is that I see women creating new pathways for interfaith families. Um, the piece that I wrote that's in the booklets that Georgetown put out, which are really beautiful, is about the idea that the founders of most of the interfaith family support groups, in fact, I think all of them, in the US and in Europe that I researched were all women. And I found this very fascinating, that it's women who are sort of using that creative tension and energy around having two faiths in the family to find new pathways to help the family stay connected and be dual faith or be faithful in new ways. Um, it's, it's really interesting how times change and um, how we change. I know how much I've changed just as being a parent. But I'm going to go back one more generation. Um, my, um, so when I got married, it really was not even a, a question of, as to whether I would marry Muslim or somebody who was not Muslim. It wasn't even a question. I knew I was going to marry Muslim, never thought of anything else. Um, I did know that in, the pre in my pre previous generation, my grandfather had disowned one of my uh, aunts for marrying a man who was not Muslim. I knew that. I knew that it was very painful to my mother, who was not allowed to have a relationship with her sister until my grandfather passed away. And uh, this year, my son married a Catholic woman, and so we have an interfaith marriage. And it's been a very interesting journey, uh, because in our, um, I, would say, I would say traditionally in the Muslim communities, and Muslim communities are quite different, um, there is an expectation that if you're a young woman, or, or not so young woman, but if you're a Muslim woman, you're going to marry a Muslim man, and if you're a Muslim man, you may marry um, a Christian or a Jewish woman, a monotheistic woman. Um, and there's an expectation, of course, that if you marry a woman who's not Muslim, that she will convert. And there can be a lot of pressure around that. Um, but for Muslim women, the idea of marrying someone outside the faith is still a very you know, controversial issue. And, and most uh, religious leaders will say that it's not acceptable at all. Um, but it's been interesting to me how, you know, I, I think that a lot of the way that we as uh, parents chose to handle and respond to my son's choice um, had a lot to do with me seeing how painful, unnecessarily painful it is to exclude. And I know that my parents, um, reading of religion is very much affected, was very much affected by you know, their own upbringing and their own experiences. And that shaped, of course, how we were raised as girls. And I think it allowed us sort of to, to read the text more critically and to um, kind of have maybe different, uh, different ideas and opinions than um, traditionally what Muslims might, might think. And so in some ways, um, you know, I, I'm, real, excuse me, I'm really grateful to my son because he's really forced us to uh, practice what we say we believe and, uh, um, and to really live 
and this interfaith uh, model. Um, and I think as we go through maybe the panel, there'll be more opportunities to share, you know, some of the, the things that we've learned. But um, but times are changing. I'm meeting more and more uh, Muslim women who are choosing to marry outside of the faith for lots and lots of different reasons. Um, and they are encountering challenges, of course, within their communities of faith. Um, but it's happening. And since it's happening, it means things are changing. Um, and that's the reality. And we, you know, so it's a very, it's a very interesting time, I think. I think as a reflection of the country being majority Christian, the issue in Christian communities tends to be more about marrying someone who is of a different level of piety than you are. And so that is the thing I see most frequently and also see most frequently causing problems. So, uh, you know, a friend will marry someone who they think is basically the same and then when it, when they start having kids or something and they realize that they're not having the same approach to their religion or they have different understandings of what an active church life might be, that can cause a lot of tension. And in Christianity, you're not prohibited from marrying someone outside the faith, but there are some guidelines about you know, being equally yoked with someone. Uh, so there's sort of a aspirational goal that you would be with someone who has the same, uh, you know, roughly the same understanding as you. But the thing I also find interesting that um, was just touched on was that you know, Christianity also talks about the faith being a division of fam a, a, a means of families getting divided. Uh, if you don't share that faith, it can separate fathers from sons, daughters-in-laws from mothers-in-law. And um, I think in America, Christians would rather decrease their faith than see any severing in their family. So I see a lot of people just sort of modifying their religious views so as to keep peace in the family. And I just think that's kind of an interesting, you know, change from maybe previous generations. Hmm. Molly, can I ask you to start with the next question? I'd like to talk a little bit about, I'll call it delayed marriage, but women that are getting married a little bit older, um, after they're 18 years old, maybe Salma can also speak to this. Um, how, what are some of the ways that women of faith are navigating their life paths, their aspirations for a career while also looking for a life partner? Yeah, I, I don't know if I have anything, like, I find this fascinating. I don't really have any brilliant thoughts on this, but obviously everyone's getting married later, and, you know, first and foremost, what I think about is sex. Like, how do you not have sex when you're getting married, you know, 20 years after you first start really wanting to have sex, you know, and that is, that's a challenge, and people are navigating that in, you know, very different ways, but, uh, you know, traditional Christianity has very strict understandings of the gift of sex and when it is to be enjoyed and how it is to be enjoyed, and it's really hard to be a young woman in a culture that delays marriage for, again, like career gains um, when you want to be a faithful Christian. And I, um, there was one other thing I was thinking of, but I just forgot it. So maybe I will pipe in in a second. Sorry. Yeah, feel free to. Okay. Jump in. Yeah, I just had four hours of sleep last night. It's really not good, and I might just interject at inappropriate moments for the rest of the day. <laughs> Thanks for the warning. <laughs> um, I think that in the um, Muslim community, which I want to say is a very diverse community culturally, the the Muslim. Uh, Muslims in America are the most diverse faith group in the country. So it's really important to bear that in mind so that whatever I'm saying here may or may not fit for, for any particular Muslim that you would discuss these same issues with. So um, I just want to, to put that out there. But, you know, as a therapist, I, um, and I work primarily within the Muslim community, so I mostly get to hear of the challenges that people are having. People rarely make an appointment with me to talk about a success story, so you, you should also be aware <laughs> that that's kind of what informs me. But I would say that from that perspective, um, and also in, in working with community leaders, that the problem, that, that, that this is like a huge phenomena, it's a huge problem in our community, uh, the delayed marriage. So women are getting very mixed messages. They are being encouraged to pursue their education and pursue a career and um, to become, you know, educated and professional women. And then, when they reach the ripe old age of fill in the blank, and it varies, you know, by different ethnic communities, it could be 25, it could be whatever, 
then their families start to panic. Oh my gosh, she's not married yet. And we're failures as parents because we haven't helped her fulfill this developmental, you know, app appropriate, appropriate stage. Um, and yet women are really struggling at that. You know, when they've established their careers, they're really struggling to find men within the faith community that they feel are sort of, you know, um, going to respect and can handle uh, their um, educational um, sort of level, their career level. These are not women who are going to be dependent in a traditional sort of way. Um, and so there, there are some real challenges. And so I, I experienced women um, really struggling because they get to this place of, I really do want to get married now, and they're not finding the right match. I also hear the same struggle from men, to be honest, uh, because for, for other reasons, I think men have been delaying marriages. Um, and then, you know, parental involvement can take on lots of different and interesting forms. Sometimes parents import a younger uh, bride and, and that isn't really what the, the young man or the man is looking for because he's been raised here and is looking for somebody who's more, um, you know, thinking in a more similar way, has similar attitudes. Um, so there's lots of interesting issues that I, we're facing in the community, I think, as we're going through a transition um, like the rest of the country and the world around gender roles and gender norms uh, around marriage and, and marriage age. Um, so while I got married young at 18 and I pushed um, my, I have two sons, um, to not to get married quite so young, um, I'm aware that in other Muslim communities around the country there is still quite a big push on both the men and women getting married young as a way to protect them from premarital, uh, premar becoming sexually active before marriage. And this is a challenge that people you know, bring up, of course. How do we maintain that value of chastity if we're not married? And if we're desperately looking to get married and it's not happening, you know, now what? Uh, and so it, it does create, I think, a lot of distress. It can create a lot of distress for people. Um, yeah, so I'm Sue Katz Miller, and I am a feminist. I just wanted to put that out there. Even though I spent the morning chopping vegetables and getting a brisket in the oven so that I can celebrate the Jewish New Year tonight, why didn't my husband make the brisket? Partly because he's not Jewish, so he doesn't know how to make a brisket. Anyway, um, all of which is to say I actually bridle at the phrase delayed marriage because it implies that marriage is necessary or inevitable and it's not. Um, I would also say that I think statistically later marriages are found to be more successful to have a lower divorce rate so there's that. I also found in my research that in a lot of later marriages I think women come to that marriage with a more mature and often deeper sense of their own spirituality, faith, religion, and are more reluctant to capitulate or convert or give in on that issue when, they, if, when and if they do intermarry. So that's just an interesting dynamic that I wanted to note. Um, I would also note in terms of stories being positive or negative. One of the reasons I wrote my book was that I could not find in the literature a lot of optimistic, positive stories about intermarriage. And I wanted to find those stories and put them out there. So that's what I did. Great. If I may revisit my forgotten thoughts earlier. I, I so appreciate what you're saying. And I was thinking that the stupidity of what I just said made it sound like um, that marriage is the only right path for a woman. And I think this is a big issue in the Christian church 
in America in particular, which is that there's sort of been an idolization of becoming a spouse or becoming a mother. And so if you're not in that role, it's like there's great confusion. And the Christian understanding of vocation is really that you serve God by serving others wherever you are. So right now, if you are married, that does mean that you serve your spouse. If you have children, you serve your children. If you're single, that means that you are, you know, that is a vocation given to you by God and that you are to serve him in all the ways that you are enabled to do things because you are single, because you don't have a, uh, you know, some of these other obligations. There's a lot of liberty in that and a lot of responsibility as well. And I think that the church has kind of sent confusing messages. It's not really a Christian idea that family is the thing that matters above all other things and that if you aren't like personally married or having kids that you're worthless. That's actually quite different from the history of Christianity, which is full of single people serving God and serving other people and doing amazing things for the church. And so I sometimes worry even about like the expectation that we place like, oh, you're not married yet. Well, no, you're not married, you know, and that's really, it's like a, the period should go after that. And um, a woman just wrote a wonderful book in our church called Hello, My Name is Single. And it kind of confronted me with all the ways that we, uh, we denigrate the work of single people and that we, um, that we don't fully value their contributions to, you know, society, the church, and everything. Thank you. And in response to that, I want to follow up by asking if you think that religious institutions are adapting. Uh, I think these are stories of um, we have interfaith marriage, we can have marriage at different ages. How are the religious institutions responding to that? Are they welcoming, are they adapting, or not? What do you see from your perspective? They're adapting very, very slowly. <laughs> um, no, I, I do see progress. Uh, I was raised in Reform Judaism. My interfaith parents made the decision to choose that one religious identity for us. And there's been a huge shift in Judaism towards accepting the reality of interfaith marriage and what that means for women, what that means for men, what that means for the institutions that have been patriarchal. Um, and I, I would note that in terms of Islam, there are Muslim Christian interfaith family support groups, particularly in the UK, because I think the Muslim population in the UK is older, it's denser, it's more established, and because there's more generations there, there's been more interfaith marriage. And so you have some very lively groups of women coming together, some of them Muslim, some of them Christian, all of them intermarried, and that's pushing, pushing the boundaries. It strikes me there's a little bit of a uh, like a bias in the question though too, like an assumption that institutions need to change uh, when I don't, I mean I come from a religious tradition that doesn't think that you change your traditions based on changes in the culture. The truth is just timeless and it might like sound different in a different time and place but it's just the same sort of preached to a different people but it's the same truth over the course of time. So I'm not quite sure if I even know how to answer the question sure. because it kind of goes against our mm -hmm. foundational principles yeah. in our church. I can illustrate it with, a, with an example from my own. I have a friend who um, I believe at the age of 34, 35, we were having this conversation and she was still single and she was saying that she would never move back to a particular Midwest state because she said that all of the churches there had no idea how to deal with her as a single woman. <laughs> Nobody knew how to talk to her about anything because all of the women of her age in that cohort either were married and were talking about their children all the time. So she felt like she didn't have a place within faith communities there, whereas here in Washington, D.C., she was able to find, she could hang out with young adults and we could talk about things other than wedding plans and their children. So yeah, I don't know if that informs the... No, I mean, and I think, you know, that's, again, whatever the principle should be would not change, which is that there's an error in your thinking regardless of whether people feel disenfranchised or not when you are in a congregation and feel that you're, uh, you know, if, if the congregation, again, it makes this assumption about what it means to be a Christian and that assumption is wrong, it's wrong regardless of whether people happen to feel bad about it or not. So the church, you know, the congregations mm -hmm. that she was referring to should not have done that 
um, you know, from the get-go. But yeah, I think obviously as, you know, and divorce is a big issue too in Christianity that has become rampant. I mean, widespread for a lot of people. How do you incorporate? And I don't really, you know, I'm in a liturgical church where things are, uh, you know, everyone's welcome to participate in the liturgy, to, uh, to, to be a member of the congregation, uh, assuming they accept the, the teachings of the church. But you do feel these things, you know, how divorce divides people or how it becomes where you can't worship together or, you know, that boy is only there at church one week out of two or, you know, you, you feel these things. But I think the answer is just that churches need to understand the changing nature of society and continue to extend love to people who are in different situations. Yeah, I, I think that it really is going to vary. I mean, I think that we have many situations like the one that you talked about where where people look for another faith community where they feel comfortable. And I think that there are institutions that are much more um, aware and concerned about the reality of the community and really make uh, take proactive sort of measures to address those issues. So, you know, in the, in the Muslim community, I think that the expectation for people to get married is, is always going to be there because that's part of the sort of the religious value system is marriage. Um, however, there are also um, values about respecting people regardless of whether they're married or not. And so while marriage is highly valued, it's not uh, a sin to not be married. And there's no reason to you know, make people feel alienated in any way whatsoever. And so what I've, what I've in my work, um, you know, what, what I focus on is um, how, we, how we live up to all of the values in our religion and not just become very narrowly focused. Okay, so marriage is important, and now if you're not married, you know, there's something wrong with you. But marriage is important, and respect is important, and tolerance is important, and uh, pluralism is important. All of these values are things, and how we treat people is really important. It's more important, in fact, than getting married. You know, so we also have to sort of look at our values and what our religion teaches us. As far as institutions, I think that, you know, there is such a broad range within the Muslim community, and there are some institutions that are quite rigid and are not going to uh, even acknowledge the reality of uh, Muslim Americans, and there are other institutions that are you know, in promoting marriage, um, and uh, they, they've tried to develop sort of ways to help people get married more easily. Um, and I think that the conversations in certain mosques are very different than other mosques. So, in, you know, in some mosques, you can talk about some of the challenges that singles face um, in meeting Muslims or marrying within the faith or, or intermarriage and how you deal with uh, intermarriage while uh, maintaining and, and respecting each person's right uh, to practice their own faith. Um, so there's, you know, I think that you're going to just find that broad spectrum. I, one of the things that I really appreciated when my son got married is our imam talking to both of them and reminding them that their job as um, people of faith is to honor each other's faith and to help each other be the best Muslim, be the best Catholic that they could be. And I know that that message isn't a message that my son would have gotten in some other mosques, um, but that's, that's the kind of message that resonates with me very deeply in terms of you know, what our faith teachings you know, call us to be and call us to do with each other. I, I'd like to add that even if you see the sort of essence and theology of your religion as timeless and immutable, I don't see how we can avoid having culture affect everything we do. And I would just note that my friend, the Reverend Amy Butler, was just, uh, I don't know if it's elected or appointed to be the first woman to be the minister at Riverside Church in Manhattan breaking a stained glass ceiling there. And, and that kind of leadership of women in religious domains, I think, inevitably changes qualities. I, I call it culture of, of religion. 
At this time, I want to remind the audience that you can uh, ask questions and we'll bring them up to me. So think about those and jot those down. And I assume someone will be able to bring them up for me or to me. I'm going to switch the topic a little bit more to into marriage and the gender that the relationships that we see within marriage. Um, so how does marriage or how does religion play into the way that a couple treats each other within this domestic space? Um, when they think about shared roles within the family, um, what kind of gender differences do we see? If I could first talk about a similarity that I think is important in Christian relationships, it's that forgiveness is the main issue that married people are supposed to practice. So we are encouraged to practice this daily to say that we forgive each other and this is something that the husband does to the wife and the wife does to the husband. This is extremely important. It's, a, it's supposed to be a daily practice. I can show you, um, my husband and I just had to do this with each other today and, uh, and every day. It's really no secret. So um, I think that's, you know, it's as important as it is to lay out what gender differences there are. There are also, it's important to note the similarities. But I have written before about uh, I'm a submissive wife and I am surprised at how, I grew up in a culture where that was not in any way weird or different, and, um, and now I'm in a culture where that's like the most countercultural thing you can say. And it's partly, I think, because it's not well understood what Christian submission means. So in Christian marriage, the, the model is Christ and the church. And so men are to be like Christ, uh, which means sacrificing everything, and women are to submit to their husbands as the church does to Christ. And I always find it really fascinating that if, you're in a, if you hear that people are upset about these Christian, this Christian picture, they're almost always upset about the part that the woman has to do, and they're never upset about the part where the dude has to die. You know, and I think that's really interesting that we think it's so awful on the one hand. It's actually much more challenging, I think, and in fact, I think men would, you know, they struggle with it a lot, that, that, that level of self sacrificial giving that is expected of them. And obviously, you know, women fail at it too. Cue back to the forgiveness issue. But I just, um, I think that it, we, we focus on what the women are expected to do and we should also focus on what men are expected to do in Christianity as well. Um, I, th I think this is like a, such a huge um, topic, um, this question. And it's a, I think it's a really fascinating one. Um, you introduced you know, the word culture, and I think that culture is super important when we are looking at how religion plays out in gender relations, because you know, our respective cultures, and whether it's our ethnic culture or whether it's the cultural you know, religious context that we're in, is going to inform how we understand our religion. And so I, what I see couples doing all the time is um, saying that they are implementing their religious teachings when, uh, for example, a husband is dominating or trying to control his wife's behavior, saying that um, I am simply you know, doing what the Quran has told me to do. Whereas I find it fascinating when I read the Quran, I just don't see that anywhere. Um, <laughs> um, my reading of the Quran and, and the reading that I promote is that marriage is a mutually loving relationship it's a relationship and that should be mutually satisfying. And my sort of reading of the life of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, who's our, our role model, role model for both men and women, is that his leadership style was a very consultative, collaborative leadership style, um, where he engaged uh, his wives, women in the community, young people, old people, um, consulted them on all kinds of affairs, including matters of state, not only personal matters. And so, you know, to me, you know, I sometimes get uh, couples who come in and the husband, having seen my picture online and made some assumptions about what kind of Muslim I am, will say, you know, I, here's my wife, I need you to teach her how to be obedient. And I say, <laughs> Okay, well, I believe, you know, and I, my understanding of marriage is that it's a, it's a partnership and that both husband and wife are obedient to God and the primary submission is to God. 
And within that context of submission to God, we can start looking at kind of what informs your, your respective understandings of gender roles. Um, you know, it's not that my reading has to be the only reading, but um, I'm very clear about the ways in which the obedience card has been used um, in a way that doesn't really seem to uphold those, those values of mutuality, of uh, justice, of um, you know, mercy, kindness, humility, forgiveness um, you know, within a marriage. And you know, I appreciated what was said in a previous panel about um, you know, shared power. And I think that word of you know, sharing this partnership and sharing the goal of how we as a couple can um, then become we as a family whose mission is to submit to God and to please God. And within that context, uh, I, I see absolutely no problem with um, sort of, um, you know, working together. And if that means today I go your way and tomorrow you go my way, I think that's the only way really that, that a marriage can, can function. But when people feel the need to use an, like the obedience card um, or need to assert I'm the boss and you need to do what I say, then I think we've really lost sort of what makes a marriage and a partnership and one in which both partners are submitting first to God. I very much appreciate what you said about culture being the issues. For interfaith couples, they don't fight about whether the physical resurrection occurred. They don't fight about whether monotheism or polytheism is better. They fight about who's going to make dinner and whether to ground the teenager. And it's really not religious? religious content. But I almost have never seen... I mean, it, it, there are rare cases where in a bitter divorce religion becomes a tool for fighting. But it's, I, I think it's very rarely a cause of the actual conflict. Deciding which question to go with next. One does address and ask specifically about this idea of partnership, of whether um, religion, whether each of you from your particular religious traditions if religion can evolve from a patriarchal model to a more of a partnership model. And that was, that was framed within the idea that uh, in, in some marriages and in some coupling, there can be exclusion, exclusion based on the fact that it may be an interfaith coupling or that there's just a different culture that comes in. And that idea that it, of exclusion being more patriarchal. And so if you would like to expand on this idea of partnership within marriage uh, from a religious standpoint, that would be great. But if not, that's I, there was one thing I wanted to mention, which I'd been writing a piece recently about. Uh, there was an article that said home-cooked meals were tyrannical and oppressive, and it's awful for people who have to do them. And I was doing some research, and I came across this quote from Martin Luther, who died, you know, however many 500 years ago. And he's talking about how, uh, you know, some people come to marriage and they think, oh, you know, this is so awful, I have to rock the baby, I have to change his diaper, I have to get up in the middle of the night, and I have to take care of his mother, and blah, blah, blah. And he goes into great detail about all this like domestic work he has to do. He's making a point that you shouldn't look at it this way, you should look at serving your children and your wife as holy blessings. But I was like, that's interesting, 500 years ago, men changed diapers. Like, we get these ideas about what is a traditional female role and what is a traditional male role, but I think sometimes we, so we're, we're, we put these um, ideas on top of our other ideas about what it means to be submissive or what it means to have a partnership or whatnot. And I think we should just be very careful that we understand where our own biases come in about what is a traditional male role or what is a traditional female role you know, as it relates to work and childcare and domestic duties. Uh, sometimes we, again, ascribe to religion things that are actually just our personal biases or uh, you know, something we learned at home. I mean, I'm, I'm going to uh, just take a risk here and say that I don't think that patriarchy is inherently evil, okay? Patriarchy in, it, in and of itself, 
um, and that's the way sort of the world has run, you know, for, for millennia, in and of itself isn't necessarily evil. So even within our patriarchal systems, and you, you referenced um, Martin Luther, I'm gonna reference the prophet, uh, prophet Muhammad, peace be on him, so definitely Arabian society was quite patriarchal and he was a product of that patriarchal society and he was also a revolutionary in that patriarchal society. Um, and he, we have stories where his grandsons are playing on his back while he's prostrating in prayer and he's leading the community in prayer. And so again, you know, just to kind of you know, emphasize your point, um, the things that we, you know, kind of are advocating for are things that have been happening. They may not have been the dominant stories. And I think what needs to happen, even, you know, especially within our faith communities, is to help men see that uh, there are role models for men of faith, leaders, prophets, uh, in, in our case, um, who lived a model of partnership in marriage. So even, you know, in a, in a uh, most Muslims would say that the husband is the leader in the family. And even in that leadership, though, it's not the kind of leadership that's a dictator. It's a leadership where there is someone and he has a co-leader, um, but they're working together. And it's not a, uh, an oppressive sort of relationship. Again, you know, it's, it's a consultative and, and collaborative model. And so we do have that model. And so I think it's just important that we, we don't throw everything out the window when we hear the word patriarchy. But within our histories, you know, we can find these, you know, really beautiful examples and models of partnership and leadership that is not uh, an oppressive kind of leadership. It's a leadership that includes the gifts and talents of everyone in the community including women and children, old and young. Thank you. Um, I would just add that in an interfaith couple, it's particularly important that you have a partnership where you make this very intimate decision together on what the religious life of your family is going to look like and what you're going to pass on to your children for me, it is problematic that there are religious institutional prescriptions on how that should look, and they're gender-based. So, for instance, in Judaism, halakhically, which is according to Orthodox or conservative Jewish law, the children are going to be only Jewish if the mother is Jewish, and the father, tough luck. Um, conversely, interestingly to me, Traditionally in Islam, the children will be raised Muslim if the father is Muslim. So you have this very interesting situation in a Muslim-Jewish intermarriage where you can have both religions claiming the children. I don't necessarily think this is a problem because I'm in favor of passing on both religions to the children because I believe that children grow up and make their own decisions eventually anyway about what they want their beliefs and practices to be. And that in a way, we can give our children labels, we can give them educations, but we can't necessarily make those stick anyway. Um, so I forget what the question was, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, that adds, that's great. I have a quick clarifying question for Salma, and then we'll get to some questions about sex. Um, so can you explain a little bit more about how a Muslim man is permitted to marry a Christian or a Jewish woman, but the same is not permissible for a Muslim woman? Uh, what's the reason for this distinction? Uh, that's one. Um, and the other is just asking that um, when a Muslim woman marries outside of the faith, are, is that woman still connected with the Muslim community typically? Or um, do they have hopes or expectations that their spouse will convert? I, I think that means that the woman's spouse will convert, but I'm not sure. So you guys really want to hear that answer before we talk about sex? That's not fair. Um, <laughs> um, so just very quickly. Um, um, so it really is uh, to what, what Stan was just saying in terms of in the Muslim tradition, the children do take the religion of the father. 
And so the idea is that if a man marries outside the faith, outside of Islam, then um, his children are still going to be Muslim. Whereas if a woman marries a Christian man or a Jewish man, then those children will be Christian or Jewish. Um, I, I, as a mother, um, I think that what happens in most households is that the mother is the one who is primarily with the children, and I think that the children often learn their faith from the mother. Um, so I find it, you know, I find this to be a little interesting, but it's more of a sort of, um, they take the religion of Islam by name, by identity, but they may or may not. And, this, and what I see in many um, families that are of intermarriage, uh, the children of intermarriages, they often choose neither religion or they're not religious, you know, they're not religious at all or they're totally confused or they, they, they may identify with both. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily know that it, in terms of self-identity what happens. Um, in terms of women who marry um, men who are not Muslim, Muslim women who marry men who are not Muslim, um, I would say that this is sort of an evolving um, issue for us. It, it still remains to be seen. But the few um, women that I know in those situations, they actually have maintained connections to the mosque and the community. Um, I've noticed that you know, they tend to affiliate with communities that are more open. And um, regardless of what the um, institution's um, stance is on marriage, you know, Muslim women marrying outside the faith, but it, these are communities where, regardless of what I personally believe, I will still treat you, you know, the way I should treat you. And so, you know, they can, they can feel relatively accepted. Um, but there are, there are um, definitely, um, probably I would say that in the most, most cases, um, most, the Muslim view is that those marriages are not legitimate marriages. And so I think for Muslim women who are uh, making that decision, uh, they may really face quite a bit of opposition and resistance. Thank you for that. So our questions about sex. I'll, I'll read them both because they do funnel into each other and I'll just read them to um, respect the people that wrote them. So the first is very specific to Islam, but I think can be asked of the others. Uh, how do Muslim families combat the American society's acceptance of premarital sex that is so rampant in our culture? Do we accept it as a norm and give in, or do we try to explain to our children to please wait um, until marriage to have sex? And then the other person asks, do you think that young feminists of faith can contribute to the development of sexual ethics that are faithful, but perhaps allow for singles to have sexual lives in a culture of delayed marriage? Um, not just looking for the vocation of celibacy, but more talking about holy sex for single people. Well, I'll just address uh, the first piece. I mean, I think that, you know, as people of faith, we are teaching our children all kinds of values that may or may not conform with the values of the, you know, the general public. Um, so whether it's, whether it's sex or whether it's you know, alcohol, in the case, you know, for Muslims, or alcohol is also not uh, accepted. Uh, whether it's, um, for, for Muslims, also accepting or dealing with interest. Whether it's um, praying five times a day, regardless of where you are. I mean, these are all things that we practice. Uh, whether it's the way that I'm choosing to dress, which doesn't exactly conform with, you know, the, the latest fashion trends. Um, these are all ways in which we have to learn how to navigate being different and living up to living out our values. And so I think, you know, for parents, the same way that you teach your child any other value that may or may not be the same as what's happening in school, um, you teach them about sex as well. And I, it, it certainly is quite challenging, um, given obviously the very strong messaging in, a, in our society of kind of um, instant gratification, self-indulgence, you know, whatever makes you feel good, you should do that. Um, now, it's all about now, it's all about me. And these are, these are societal values, American cultural values, that go against many faith teachings, not just Islam. And I think that's really important to instill in children, you know, kind of their identity 
And again, that relationship with God and submitting to God as opposed to submitting to, I guess, you know, the, the temptation, giving in to whatever the temptations are. And then finding people that your children can grow up with that share similar values. I know for my children, you know, Muslim children in, in the public school uh, setting, um, it was very helpful for them to have Christian friends who also believed in abstinence and waiting until marriage. And I think that's what made it, you know, possible for them to, to manage. Yeah, I'd just like to weigh in on both of those questions, I guess. I, I always got a kick out of my mom, who is about as American as you can get, used to always uh, say, oh, no, we don't do that. The Americans do that, but we don't do that. And I was like, you're American. We're all American here. What's going on? But she was very conscious of how different our cultural values were from dominant American cultural values. And I, I, I always felt like she was a Russian spy or something. You know, <laughs> That's what those other people do. But I think that there can be a lot of comfort in just teaching your children right from the outset how different you are from the dominant culture. And then it's not such a crash for them when they realize that they are part of a different culture. And we do, I think a lot of people try and make it seem like they're more like everybody else. And that might actually not help you instill or inculcate the values that you desire your children to uphold. But moving on to the sex one, mm -hmm. that's okay. I just, I find it fascinating um, just how sex obsessed we are at this point in history in a way like Obviously everyone has always been obsessed with sex. That's why we're here We had parents who you know also were obsessed with sex and they had parents who were obsessed with sex So it goes back to the beginning, but there's something very unique about our current place where we think that like sexual identity is the be-all end-all it's everything and and everything must conform to it and that is probably not going to work very well with traditional belief systems such as Christianity, which has always had a very rigorous uh, understanding of sex as, uh, you know, ideally two people join together in Congress for life. So that is something that doesn't need to, you don't need to be Christian to have this understanding, but in Christianity you call it the you know, one flesh union. And, you know, the way to kind of think of it from a like secular way is that uh, you know, we all have our complete biological systems in every way except for one, reproduction. And to have that be made fully whole, you join with someone who has the other parts that are needed. And this is, you know, this creates a one flesh union. That's what knocking boots means. That's what it's about. And so to be able to do that outside of a permanent lifelong commitment is not going to be a Christian ideal. Um, yes, obviously everyone's having sex outside of marriage, more or less. And uh, that's a you know, huge issue, but I don't see how you can take you know, rather clear teachings in Christian scriptures and a rather consistent understanding for thousands of years and uh, change it without doing damage to you know, basically like the entire understanding of what it means to be created male and female and what it means uh, to uh, create loving conditions for children and all those things that go along with sex, even if we'd like them not to go along with sex. Well, thank you all. I'd like to wrap up our time just so that we can get on to the rest of our, to our other panel. But I would like to thank you all for bringing your unique perspectives and stories to this topic. So I hope that we are sparking some conversations that will continue immediately after this and then later during the reception. Let's go ahead and thank our panel. Thank you.